So yeah, thank you everyone for joining uh, the first session of uh, the MLT init. Um, MLT init is organized through uh, MLT, which is Machine Learning Tokyo, as most of you probably know. And M Machine Learning Tokyo is a Tokyo-based nonprofit organization. Currently, uh, we have more than 8,000 uh, members, including machine learning engineers, researchers, data scientists. And the goal of, of MLT is to make machine learning more accessible to everyone. And we do this with uh, talks, workshops, study sessions, and, and of course, we someone is <laughs> writing in my screen. Uh, yeah. So yeah, MLT in it is also one of the sessions that, uh, that yeah, belongs to MLT. You have more information in, in here in MLT uh, in the starter kit. So yes, MLT is organized by me, Miguel, and Jason. The main goal of MLT is to present and discuss fundamental, fundamental deep learning papers, right? And here I marked uh, discussing because that's the main purpose of, of uh, MLT in it, right? We want to uh, actually go through these papers and to try to extract as much information as we can and discuss. So we, we all learn a lot of things. And uh, presenters will try to uh, provide the summaries, codes, visualizations in order that we can make the most of this. We can make this useful for everyone. Um, I'm gonna explain a bit how the session is gonna be. So we will have five minutes introduction, which is this thing I'm doing right now, presenting MLT in it. Then we will have a 25 minutes presentation and a 60 minutes discussion. You can see that the discussion has uh, the most of the time allocated because that's again, the main goal of MLT in it. We are, going to, we are going to record the introduction and the presentation. So this is being recorded right now. But, and then later we will upload this video to YouTube. And afterwards we will post the link in the repository in machine learning Tokyo uh, slash in it. Um, we are not going to record the discussion. And the reason why we do it this way is because, uh, well, we are encouraging everyone to uh, talk during the presentation and during the discussion. So we want to leave the discussion as a place like to keep your privacy, right? So if you don't want to be recorded during the presentation and you still want to participate, you can do it in the discussion. And, and that's not going to be recorded. Oops. Uh, so yes, the way the presentation uh, is going to be is that uh, we will have a presenter who will give a presentation and then during the presentation, you can write your question or the intention to ask in the Slack channel, right? Uh, this is the Slack channel. So I'm gonna be actually monitoring the channel all the time. So if you have a question during the presentation, I will either read it or if you actually say that you want to talk, I will give you room. The reason why we do it this way is because maybe during the presentation, someone want, or more than one person wants to talk at the same time. So this is like a way to organize it. And during the discussion, um, we are gonna do it like in a turn-taking system. So we, you just need to write in the Slack the intention to participate. And then this is just to have some organization. Right? And then I will just uh, give floor to the person who, who wants to talk how to get the most out of MLT in it. So before the session, this was already written in the meetup and in the MLT in it uh, web uh, repository, but yeah, please read the paper beforehand because we're not gonna read it here. Here is basically to, to discuss it. Uh, join us with questions and comments in mind, because again, the main goal is to discuss. So it's good to have uh, questions in mind and join the Slack channel, uh, which it's very important to uh, participate, right? So this is the Slack channel. And if you haven't joined the Slack yet, this is the, this is the URL. So machinelearningtokyo.slack.com. During the session, please participate with uh, comments and questions. As I said before, right? You just write it on the channel and be nice and polite to others because we all come here to learn and to enjoy. Then after the session, you can volunteer to participate and you can write us some feedback or propose papers, etc. 
in the feedback form, which is in the in the, this repository. Right. One of the things that we will try to do is to to have some collection of papers and then probably in the Slack channel, we will do a poll and then we can decide which paper is going to be next. So far, we already uh, we already agreed some of them, but uh, this is one of the ideas for the future. All right. So just a little bit about me. Um, well, my name is Miguel. Currently, I'm a PhD student, a third year PhD student, I guess, uh, at UEF in Finland. And my main work is about rat brain lesion segmentation with deep learning. And uh, Jason Kunanan is the other co-organizer. Um, co he is the first one who will present. He is currently an AI researcher and slash uh, engineer at AI Inside in Tokyo. And he got uh, previously a GSPS International Fellowship to uh, for the postdoc at Saitama University. And he also holds a PhD in mathematics uh, from Nagoya University. In his free time, he likes to play guitar, esports, and snowboarding. And that's it from for the um, introduction. Now Jason will present. Let's see how we do this. I will just stop sharing the screen. Okay. I think now you can. Um, Share and present. Oh, okay, so you can see it, right? Yeah, so thank you for coming, everyone. And as uh, Miguel mentioned, we are going to be hosting this uh, monthly uh, discussion. And uh, so I'm the first volunteer. So the next one would be Miguel. And uh, just to add a little bit more of, uh, of what I actually do. So what are my hands-on experience uh, in my company? Uh, I'm building a OCR model for, let's say, for reading documents and um, such as invoice or, or receipt. And these are in many different languages. So you, you can say that my experience in deep learning is uh, leaning towards more computer vision. But I do keep keep up with try to keep up with the NLP uh, development. So uh, I'm also looking forward to volunteers of uh, of NLP presenters for this uh, for this meetup. Okay, so uh, the choice of paper that I want to talk about is uh, exception, and the reason for this is that uh, well. I just like the paper initially. And um, I think it gives a, a very fundamental way of, uh, of thinking and how to, to do research. It gives, it, I like that it gives you a methodology on, on, how, on how he arrived, how the author arrived at such architecture. So I want to kind of fill the gaps on, on, the, on the papers that, so I quoted some, some, some of the, uh, uh, lines that I, I think needs clarification and I, that I thought needs some visualization. And um, we'll, we, I will be discussing uh, those things. So, but first, um, I will start with something that I did this, uh, the, uh, this winter holidays, which is uh, building puzzles. So, so how does, how do humans build puzzles? Well, it's a uh, it's basic pattern matching, right? You know some things are gonna be on the edge because of their shape, and or some things are gonna be on the corners because of their shape. And like, uh, like this missing piece over here, you get a piece, right? To feel that, you get a piece, you run it, you check like which, which uh, part is this, does this belong? And then you, you match it, right? So there's matching there. You look, you have a piece, and then you're looking for things to match. But let's let's be more concrete. When we say we're matching something, what do we actually do? What are we looking for? We're looking for spatial information. That is precisely what we're looking for. First the shape, and then the color. So what I want to put here probably is not white, right? It's, it's something dark with, with certain kind of shape. So, so that is how 
least how I do puzzle uh, building puzzles, right? So I think uh, I just realized this this would be a good analogy for for a convolutional neural network. So what I'm showing here is not your usual conf 2D layer, but just the mathematical operation of which is a discrete 2D convolution, which does what, what I was talking about earlier. So I have, maybe you're familiar, what they call a kernel, which is that three by three here, that shows, that's my pattern. I'm moving it, right? I'm moving it and looking for things that looks like it, okay? So, well, you're writing a program. So how does, how do you do similarities in mathematics? Well, you do it with dot products, right? You know, but, but you would say, hey, that's a square. It's not like a vector. Well, you, you can vectorize it. And uh, so what is happening here, if you can see the next, uh, they would, yes, that, this part, this is just element-wise multiplication, right? So you can think of it as, say, if they, they just flattened it and then they just got product it, then they move it. So the main idea is you get the similarities by, by that products and you can do it using element-wise multiplication like that, or which is more known as the convolution operation, right? Okay, so what we know here is uh, we get we understand spatial correlations here. There's a mapping of spatial correlations because you, if, like on this box, you care about those things that are near, that are inside that, right? And then you move your pattern. Then you get the score there. You put the score on the, on the output. How much similar is this pattern to this? As you move. Okay, so that's the basic, what I will call convolution operation, okay? This is not your Conv2D. Because, uh, sorry, the conf2d is this guy over here, um, which, uh, okay, how does the conf2d layer, which is both implemented in Keras and in PyTorch, do? So for this simple illustration, you have a three input channel and you want one channel output. So you will have to do the conf omp op three times. You have three different filters here, or this, this guy, kernels here, three different kernels, and you do the operation for each of these channels. And then you add it. Adding them makes you have a one channel input. So this, this uh, let me read the code from the, uh, from the paper, it says, uh, a single convolutional kernel is tasked with simultaneously mapping cross-channel correlations and uh, spatial uh, correlations. So we know the conv op do the spatial correlations as I'm showing here on this side, right? We know it does spatial correlations. Cool. So where is cross-channel correlations happening? It's because of this choice here, this sum. This is, this is an element-wise summing. Let's say this, this corner here, imagine that, not that corner there, seven. With that corner here, the corner in this part. So that's what he means when he says the convolutional kernel is simultaneously mapping cross-channel correlations and spatial correlations. Okay, so you have no choice, right? Once you use conf 2 d you are gonna simultaneously map cross-channel correlations and spatial correlations which are used in previous uh, um, known papers, like the VGG architecture, right? It's just piling up several of uh, conf2d layers. Okay, so let's, I think there's a lot of things to, under, to, to understand from this uh, GIF on the left-hand side. Say this is one by one. Oh, by the way, this is a three by three kernel here. Say this is a one by one kernel. So if it's a one by one kernel, then it's basically a constant multiplication, right? It doesn't do much as is if it's one channel, really doesn't do anything. But so that, that means there's no special correlations, right? If you're doing one by one, but 
you still have cross-channel correlations because, because of this part here. Be because for every constant, you have different constants you're multiplying here. And so those that acts as your cross-channel correlations. So with that, I'd like for you to remember that if you're using a one by one conv 2 d layers, they're only mapping cross-channel correlations gives you that choice just to check the cross-channel correlations. Uh, Jason, and, one, Jason, there is one question, uh, beginner question. What does the kernel signify? Any analogy? Um, yeah, it's physically, it, it signifies a pattern. It's uh, like here seems like the biggest is at the center. So it, it signifies a pattern for much deeper part. If you, yeah, if you know something from a Fourier analysis, you, you can understand this as a collection of frequencies. So for each filters, you, you only select a certain kind of frequencies. But for now, just look at it as how similar are those numbers to that from minus one, minus one, five, minus one, five, and zero. That's, uh, that's it. And we're asking the, the deep net, the, the, the neural network to guess those things, to find us, find us those things. Okay, so moving on. So after understanding that, let's go to what the author claimed as the inception hypothesis. So you, you, you need to have a hypothesis before writing a, a neural network. So the hypothesis is that the, the cross-channel correlations and spatial correlations are sufficiently decoupled. It is, it is preferable not to map them jointly. That is, that is the hypothesis. So they want to separate the cross-channel and the spatial correlations. So um, I'm showing you a simplified inception module. And the way they did this is that they first have the input entering different uh, one by one convolution to D. And we just, I just uh, made clear earlier that this is only cross channel correlations. But this is still mixed, right? So they did some part of decoupling here. There's a, sen there's a certain sense of uh, decoupling. Here. And so, um, what I want to say next is that, so, okay, going back. Imagine this one by one now, just stacks, stacks of papers, let's say. You have like three stacks of papers, right? So it's okay if you just have them all pile up together as like one big stack. And then you just say now that on this segment, I will run a different three by three conf to D. And on the middle segment, I will run this three by three conf to D. So this is an equivalent formulation as, as in the previous uh, slide. But uh, what is, uh, is kind of clear to ask here is that, okay, so if I can segment the output, so how many is good, right? That, that's a natural question. And what is the effect? of this uh, partitioning. And also the, another question that the author asked is that uh, would it be reasonable to have a much stronger hypothesis than, uh, than the inception hypothesis, which is that uh, you can actually completely uh, have a mapping of uh, cross-channel correlations and spatial correlations, which are mapped completely separately, right? Because as I said, it, it's still not. This is still a mix of, uh, of both correlations. Um, so, and so here is what he called an extreme inception module. So suppose, suppose you have uh, an output channel of let's say six channels, right? So on each of those channels, on each of those channels, you will run the convolution to the, that's really, not choosing how many segments, or no, just put it on one on each piece. 
let's run it on each bit. Uh, that's why it's extreme. Now recall that um, this, this is again, pure cross channel correlations. And, and if, if only one channel enters a quant 2D, as I've illustrated earlier, there's no addition happening, right? There's only one. So it's, it's your conv OP that I wrote in the beginning. So it's purely a spatial correlation. And then you, you concat it. So this is, the, this is the idea on how he arrived at this uh, extreme inception module. But um, this, is, this, this part here is, is not new. It's nothing new by that time, by the time of writing, because certain uh, art layers have been actually implemented. It's what they call a separable conv2d, which works like this. Again, I just for a sake of example, I limit to six channel input. For each of those, you have conv2d, and then you concat, and then you push them to a one by one conv2d. Also, actually, this part here is another well commonly implemented layer called the depthwise conv2d with this depth multiplier one meaning that each channel would be, would have corresponding filter equal to the, num the depth multiplier. So since it's one, so one channel here gives you one filter here. If it's not, then, uh, then this diagram is wrong. So, um, so there's, there's a difference, right? Between this implementation and, and what he was, uh, talking about. There are two minor differences. Um, first is the order of operations. So earlier he was, well, we are doing one by one first, and then this going uh, through deep. But this time it's reversed. And the second one is the presence and absence of nonlinearity on the, on the first operation. The second operation doesn't matter because there's always going to be a usually a uh, non-linearity there because you stack them, right? So the first uh, difference does not really matter because as I said, we are gonna stack this, uh, these modules anyway. So if you stack another set come to the on top of this, so that means the ones entering on the, on the upper stack is a one by one conf to d, which is gonna enter here. So it's essentially the same. The, the difference that, that uh, actually matters is the presence and absence of nonlinearity on, uh, on this part here. Because in the inception module, everything after the, the operations, they do a nonlinearity, like a relu, for example. But in this case, the, this implementation does not have a nonlinearity there. It just, just computes this linearly and then push it no nonlinearity. And okay, now I want to show uh, some things that, that we need to be, uh, we need to take caution, caution, or I mean, it's nice to know. Uh, so here, these are, these, are not, these are very simple illustrations, right? So I start with an input 28 by 28 by three. And I want a 32 output filter using a three by three kernel, okay? And I'm using, uh, and I'm, I'm running this to a separable conf d and it says I, I have 155 parameters, cool. As we notice, as I've shown in the diagrams earlier, we can actually recreate, we can create the separable conf d ourselves, right? using a depthwise conv2d with depth multiplier one, followed by a conv2d with a one, uh, one by one conv2d with the corresponding 32 filters, right? But you will see that I have 158 parameters here. So that means they're not the same, but they are. The thing is, 
the the difference is uh, it's not so obvious because of this uh, option here, the use bias. By the way, all my diagrams, I'm not just including the bias, just for the sake of cleanliness. Uh, but uh, if you've read enough of this, you know that uh, it's like a line, like y is equal to mx plus b, right? There's always your slope times your vector plus b, your intercept or your bias. There's always that. It's not just good for illustration in that, in that diagram. So this use bias uh, fall. So if I, is this running? If I actually put, um, I think yeah, if I write, use bias falls here, then I will have the exact same numbers because of that hidden, uh, um, sorry, because of that option there. So they're assuming, the, the implementation assumes that the depth-wise doesn't have a bias. There's, there's a benefit there and, and also some things that I've seen recently in, in modern architectures, which uh, the thing is without bias, you're, you're always thinking you're passing the origin, right? And if you're passing, passing the origin, then uh, if, you're use, if these networks are used, let's say, as backbones, then that's nice. Why? Because there's more generalization. You just need to know the orientation or the slope. You don't need to know where exactly it is. So if, if it's, let's say, a backbone of, of some network, then it's, it's, it has a good generalization. So I've noticed that like the efficient net uh, when uh, used is implements a, a use bias false uh, part. So that's, that's one thing that I want to, to, to show here. There's this... Uh, um, not so obvious, because <laughs> I was when I first run this, I thought hey, they should be the same initially, but then they're not. Why? I didn't know to. But then it's that. So why why the difference of three? By the way, why the difference of three? Why was it one fifty eight earlier? It's because the three biases come from comes from this initial three layers. So each each layer, as you run, the kernel would have one bias each. So that. So if you have them gone, then you have 155. Cool. Um, now, if you have used bias false on separable conf 2D, and that would also become way smaller because the conf, uh, the, yeah, this one, the original conf 2D would also have no bias. So that would be that, that difference of 32 which is if you had 32 here, it's 155. So that's, there's that. And uh, so this is just showing that, yeah, uh, separable conf 2 d with a use bias force is exactly this, uh, this, this guy here. And one benefit of using this is control of understanding and using this, uh, these layers is control. This is, this is why in efficient that you notice they're using the depthwise cons 2D because there's much control there. Unlike the separate, unlike on this part. And also there's not much wasted computation. Like look at the, look if I just want to, to use a cons 2D with the same number of filters. I will have 896 input. So that's like seven times of, of that one. So yeah, yep, that's uh, what I want to, to illustrate uh, here. Some things to, that are not so obvious to me when I was uh, ex experimenting these layers. Um, next. Next, I think um, I'm just, um, yeah, uh, for the sake of completion, let's, let's see the actual, this is the actual uh, architecture for 
the exception. So he, he has what he calls an entry flow, a middle flow and an exit flow. Um, he starts with two, this part. Uh, first, you know, the stack of uh, con uh, convolution layers, nonlinearities. This is why I said earlier, the second operation always has because uh, because of this pattern here, right? You always have this uh, prelude there. And then there's a skip connection. And um, this might this might be okay, right? I mean, it's it's a choice. This might be okay. Actually, in the efficient net, things like this are gone. They just use, they still use like a stem. It's, I think they called it a stem in efficient net. Uh, just to have, I was thinking about that. So why is the reason why is this still okay? Why is it still, still seems better to start with a full convolution 2D instead of starting with, with a depth, uh, with some depth wise or some separable uh, convolution? I, I don't know, but what we've understood earlier is that this has the, has both, has both cross-correlational, uh, spatial and cross-channel correlation. So, yeah, I don't know how to explain that. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure I want to say much about the, the architecture, why so, the, the way I presented this is really on uh, thinking a uh, perspective on, on how and why things are chosen. So I, I really wanted to understand. Uh, and, and if one knows that, then one can, can uh, might have a better hypothesis by themselves and then can try to act on that hypothesis. How, how, how would you actually work uh, to test your hypothesis. This is why I pres this this kind of uh, presentation, and uh, I think I'm I'm ending uh, it quickly here. So don't forget to so later. Don't forget to fill up our feedback form, please. And uh, so we have a volunteer uh, section there. So we're asking for vol volunteers and topics and things like that. So yeah, thank you, thank you for your time. Thanks for coming.